Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our uh, live Zoom session with Dr. Limbarakis, who is a general dentist. Um, I would like to thank him uh, right now for um, taking time out of your day to help us, um, to give us advice as pre-dental students and um, anyone who is in their pre-dental or dental journey. Um, doctor, whenever you're ready, you can start your presentation. Great. Um, thank you, Crystal. Appreciate the introduction. Glad to be here helping you all in some capacity with your dental journey. Um, I'm excited. Hope you have some good feedback, some good questions. Um, done this presentation a couple times and, and hopefully you find it worthwhile. So uh, we're calling this Dentistry a Day in the Life because I think it's going to be pretty comprehensive in terms of what we cover. All right. So how did I get here? Uh, Crystal found me on Instagram. She was stalking me. It was really weird. I'm uh, just kidding. Uh, but she, uh, she found me on Instagram and um, that's actually part of what you have to do now as a general dentist in private practice. You have to have social media presence. So um, that's how you guys found me. I went to Villanova uh, for my undergrad and was history major. So I'll talk about that a little bit. I went to Temple for my degree in dentistry, which is a DMD. And just so you guys all know, DMD and DDS are the exact same thing. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, they're just something like they're just called something different. Um, afterwards, I went to a general practice residency at Abington Hospital, which is now called Jefferson Health. And I just recently joined the staff uh, on the same residency that I was a resident in, which is pretty cool. And I've been in private practice since 2015, and I own my practice. So that's something of the last two years. All right, so why did I choose dentistry? Well, it has the ability in dentistry, you have the ability in dentistry to combine a lot of different skill sets. And so for those of you that were bio majors, I really like, you know, the sciences, you have that. But those of you who are are really big into using your hands and you like to paint and draw and you want to be, you know, you're into artistry, then you have that. A huge part of it is leadership. You know, you're a staple in your community, you're a staple and you're, and you're the go-to person in your office. I mean, the buck stops with you. So you have to be a leader. You have to learn how to develop that skill. For those people who are into being an entrepreneur, there's a huge aspect of that too. It's not for everybody and you don't have to go into that direction where you own your practice, but it's what I did and it's because I really want the, I want to own my own practice. I don't really like anyone telling me what to do. Um, then of course there's patient communication and you can teach, you teach your staff, you teach your patients. Um, there's always ability for you to grow and it's definitely, if you're not into growing, the dentistry is not for you. All right, so I let this slide because you may have seen it before, doctors, a uh, dentist is made up of doctor, engineer, and artist. And I definitely agree with that. You have to be able to treat a patient. You know, you have to be able to know the physics of dentistry, the laws that you have to abide by in, in terms of that. And you have some, to be an artist. So why should someone pursue dentistry? Well, if you enjoy working with people, if you're looking for a challenge, if you want like a easy, cushy job, this is not for you. Um, if you want to make an impact, if you want to help people, I think that's what most people start by saying, I, I want to become a doctor because I want to help people. And this is a great profession to do that. You're literally hands-on helping people out of pain. Um, you need to be a strong communicator. And if you're not, you need to be willing to learn how to become one. Because I think the most important skill you have in dentistry is not how you do with the drill, but how well you talk. And that's the number one thing from helping a patient recognize their own problem to helping them decide what, it, you know, figure out what it is and then telling them how to treat it. And if you're not a good communicator and helping, helping them through that process, you may be the world's greatest dentist. But if you can't communicate why they need something done, you'll never be able to do it and help them. Of course, working with your hands, I mentioned that before. And then if you're looking to be a leader or uh, looking for some independence, which is what private practice can offer. Okay, but it's not about the money, but it does cost a lot to become a dentist. And I'm sure you guys are all well aware. Um, and if you're not, well, I have to rip the bandaid off at this point. So here's a couple of things I 
think everyone should know if you're considering dentistry. <clears throat> I would not recommend you go into healthcare if your motivating factor is a paycheck. I think that's called a conflict of interest. We want to be, we want to do the right thing by our patients and not have to consider what the dollar amount that's becoming, you know, coming back to us. Um, it exists in every profession. So it's not like you're not going to find that in, den in dentistry. Of course you are. You're going to find that in literally every profession that exists. But if that's your number one motivating factor, I think maybe you should consider something else. My opinion. Um, why? Well, there's easier ways to make money if that's your goal. Like there's a become a business major to that. Uh, but um, dentistry is too intimate and requires too much trust between the patient and the doctor to be motivated by money. But that doesn't mean you can't make a good living, okay? Um, just don't make it the number one reason you pursue it. If you are passionate and you are good and you're dedicated and you care about your patients, then the money will come. And, you know, that will, that will be very obvious. But it is the most expensive graduate program as far as I know. And the average cost is probably more than this now, but 400,000 after four years. And then the debt can range depending on state school to a private institution from 200 to $600,000, including not including your undergraduate program or specialty programs, because not some specialty programs you have to pay for. Um, you're not paid during that. So once you factor in some fairly high interest rates uh, over a $400,000 loan, well, you're talking a pretty penny. And so you just need to be wise about it. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. It just means that, you know, you need to be smart about how you spend and make the decisions you make. So just be informed, make well thought out decisions. There are many ways to be successful, but like I mentioned before, it's not the cushiest job in the world. You have to work hard. And in the very beginning of your career, you're going to have to work weekends and long hours and nights and your work-life balance will probably not be what you want. Um, I'm doing this for eight years now, and I can tell you that still, as the owner of my practice who sets my hours, I still don't have a great work-life balance and something that I need to work on. So just be prepared for that. So when you're choosing dental school, um, because the tuitions are so astronomical, make sure that you're paying attention to what each tuition is. Um, the most prestigious school I don't know that it's going to give you that much better of an education. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Depends on what you want to do. Maybe there's a school that you, if you really want to become a specialist, then it has a reputation of, you know, being a pipeline into specialty programs. If you are someone who wants to get as much clinical experience as possible, great. Maybe choose a school that has a reputation for that. And through the grapevine, you can kind of hear which schools those are. Um, like I mentioned before, prepare to work. And... My opinion is the path to financial success is usually through practice ownership, living below your means and making good decisions with your money. So is it worth it? I think absolutely, just be smart about it. So how does the journey start? Um, as far as I know, these are the requirements from when I was in school. Uh, you guys should know all these things, but there are some schools that have some separate requirements, which I would be aware of um, and don't wait too long to start looking up what school's requirements are. I know that when I was applying, I didn't realize like I was never going to apply there just because of my location, but Ohio state, like, they had some requirements that I just didn't know about until it was too late and I couldn't add them. So other than the basics, unless you ace all of those and you know, you you crush them, I would say make sure you add a few extra science courses just to bolster your science resume. Dental schools ultimately are a business, which stinks, but that's the case. And they want to make sure that they, they're choosing a good investment and the student is their investment. They have someone that's going to flunk out while well, they've lost tuition for four years or someone that needs to repeat a year. Again, they're losing tuition. So that's all important. Um, but I would also say, you need to be multi um, multi dimensional. You know, uh, make sure you have activities. If you live your years of college just in the books and don't have anything else to show for yourself, well, I would say you probably have missed out on a few things. But you you know, everyone does it differently. 
You know, one thing that's strange for me is I sang it in an acapella group when I was in college. And for whatever reason, the dean of dental school really liked that. And so when I applied and um, eventually got in and met the, and met the uh, dean of admissions, she was like, oh, you're going to sing in the acapella group? And that's what stuck out to her. So I thought that was interesting. So one of those things that did take time away from my studies actually ended up helping me get in. So an interesting point. And then, of course, I think they all like to see that you have some history of using your hands, instruments, painting, drawing, something, you know, something along those lines, just so you can show that you can you can work with your hands. OK, so what do I do on a daily basis? As Crystal mentioned, I'm a general dentist and I really take that uh, title to heart because I like to do it all. Um, I place implants, I do orthodontics, I do cosmetic work. I, I really try to cover a lot of ground. And so I would say the daily basis is a combination of clinical procedures, exams, like hygiene exams, and uh, problem solving was a huge aspect of it and a lot of talking. So um, if you need your coffee in the morning, get that brewing. I'm not a morning person, but I know I need to be on my A game when I'm talking to 20 to 30 people every day. And I would say that if I wasn't, I am now, but the, I'm the master of multitasking because today, for example, I had uh, five patients at one time, um, two with hygienists and an emergency patient that needed something. And I had a big case I was working on and another patient that came in for something smaller. So, you know, you have to be able to think about different things at the same time, uh, which is a skill that most people learn as you grow. Uh, when you practice eight years, 10 years, 20 years, you realize that the job is not about the dentistry at that point. It's about running your practice efficiently, keeping your team on time, and the the procedures are become second nature to you. Uh, like I mentioned, there's multiple areas, specialty areas of dentistry. So whether you're a general dentist uh, or you and you like to do everything like me, or you want to focus on one particular thing, you can do that, obviously. Um, if you're a general dentist, you can also choose exactly what you want to do and focus on. So if you don't like to do something like, for example, I don't enjoy extracting wisdom teeth. I don't extract wisdom teeth. I like to do lots of extractions. I just don't like those. There's not for me. So you can just refer out. That's the beauty of being a general dentist is that, there is someone else you can pass off to um, for the most part. If you're in a rural area, maybe you don't have that ability. But for me in my area in, in suburban Philadelphia, there's a million dentists and specialists. So there's always a specialist that can uh, you can share the load with. So you guys are probably aware of this, but there's a number of different dental specialties. Um, let's just say you're someone that realizes after four years of dental school, you don't exactly enjoy interacting with patients, well, guess what? You can uh, be a pathologist and you can look in microscopes um, or you can work in public health. Or um, if you want, you can go into oral surgery and half your patients can be asleep. Um, but there's lots of different outlets for your personality. And I know that in med school, or at least I remember when my sister was in med school, she had to take the personality test. I can't remember what it's called. And that kind of gears you to like, okay, maybe you'd be someone that's better as a radiologist and, or maybe your personality, you're better as a surgeon. Um, so in general dentistry in dentistry, it's the same exact way. Uh, you can pursue something that fits your personality well, but if you're a general dentist, you have the ability to do as many of these things or as few as these, as few of these things as you want. All right, so the other thing for me is dentistry transforms lives. These are a few of my cases here. And my why, and I don't know if you guys have heard that term before, Simon Sinek has this book called Find Your Why um, or Start With Why. Well, my why is to inspire people to live their best life and breathe confidence into their lives. And for me, I know no better way than to help them smile because if someone's confident in their smile, they're gonna they're going to smile. And if someone's smiling more, they're gonna feel happier. If someone's embarrassed about their smile, 
They're not going to want to show it off. They're going to cover their mouth every time they want to laugh. That's no way to live. And so, you know, these are things that make me really happy and it makes me excited to do what I'm doing every day. So these are a variety of different cases. They, some are implants, some are simple bondings, some are bridges. Uh, the one in the middle right here, that's a temporary uh, case for 89 year old patient in bad health, but he wanted to improve his smile. And some of these are patients who have been dealing with something unsightly their whole lives and now they want to get to it. And let's see. Yep. And these are a few cosmetic cases where I had to fix some, some work from some other people. So it's really an incredible, uh, you know, feel that you can really transform lives. And I feel very lucky to be doing that on a daily basis. So dentistry blends art, science, and technology. I sort of mentioned that before. Um, Having good hand skills is important, but you need to know the science and the biology before uh, behind all of that. It was something that bored, that bored me to tears when I was in dental school, but as I've grown in, uh, in my career, I really appreciate the role that dental materials plays uh, in aesthetics and getting really great results. So you have to know that. And you have to remember that ultimately your patient is is not just a canvas. I mean, they are living and breathing. They feel pain. They're not always easy to work on. There's a tongue, there's saliva, there's blood. Um, maybe they can't open wide. So all things to be mindful of. And one thing that's really cool is that dentistry is really evolving in terms of technology and material sciences are constantly changing. The technology that we're working with on a daily basis is constantly evolving. You have to really keep up if you want to stay on the cutting edge. And that's really important to me. So I have a few videos here, I believe. Yep. So this is my cone beam CAT scan, CBCT. So for every case that I plan an implant or I place an implant, I like to plan their case ahead of time. And you can see me you know, moving the implant around in the bone. So I know exactly where the implant can go to make sure it's in the stablest, healthiest position, not impeding on any nerves or blood vessels. Uh, and that's a restore and that it's restorable. So that's really fun. And then I have another video for you here, I believe. This is me getting scanned. It's my assistant. She's using an iTero scanner, which is used for Invisalign. So that's one of our scanners. And then recently, we invested in a 3D printer. So this is the process of learning how to make a night guard. One of my assistants is doing that too. It's fun, you know, we're, we're having a good time. If you are someone that really enjoys technology or toys or whatever, I mean, it's really, it's like a great profession if you like to have gadgets with you. Um, and you can get as into this as you want, or you can, you know, stay as traditional as possible. Dentistry can be cutting edge or the old fashioned way works just fine. I prefer to be on the cutting edge. I like to make my life easier. I think it's cool. I think patients appreciate it. And so instead of a traditional workload where say I would send, uh, take an, a goopy impression and send it to a lab and it would take two weeks to come back. Well, now I can take a digital scan in three minutes. I design the night guard. And then that same day I can print out the night guard and have the patient pick it up if they wanted to. So you have some flexibility that you never used to have before when you start to incorporate a new technology. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> like I had mentioned earlier, there's always an opportunity to learn and grow. And I think one thing that's amazing about dentistry is that you always have the opportunity to learn different things and add skill sets and build your armamentarium. So when I got out of dental school, I didn't know how to place implants. I think I restored, restored one. Um, and now I placed over hundred implants. Um, but these are through courses that I've done. I learned some in my residency. Um, I don't think I did a single veneer when I was in dental school. Now I'm doing 
lots of cosmetic cases. I uh, didn't particularly enjoy orthodontics when it was taught to me. And now I see three Invisalign patients a day. Um, the one thing I did a lot of in dental school was a lot of oral surgery. Um, but all these things are things I learned after dental school. So I don't know of another profession, especially in medicine, that affords you the ability to learn so many new things that you can do on a daily basis. And of course, you have to invest your time and your money to, to do these things. But I mean, if you if you don't like what you're doing in general dentistry, learn something else and apply it because maybe you really like orthodontics and that's what you know gets you going. Um, and if, and if you don't like seeing kids, cool, do something else, you know? So there's always an ability, you always have the opportunity to grow in dentistry. So like I mentioned, it's a challenging job. There's clinical challenges and truly, you know, you'll, you'll never have seen it all. You think you do. And then something else pops up. There's patient challenges. You have to manage people's expectations. You have Patients who have a ton of anxiety and, you know, they're really difficult to work with because they have a history of dental trauma. Um, you have to have unpleasant or difficult conversations, patients who don't show up, patients who are late. Um, you have to have these challenging conversations so you can be prepared for that. And that's something you grow into. Um, you need to be able to time manage because, like I mentioned, you might have five people at one time. But you also have this interesting aspect of creating an online reputation. And I never thought I'd have to know so much about SEO and, you know, having review platforms and blogging and creating an Instagram. Uh, I think Instagram just started when I was in dental school. So, yeah. Uh, the other big thing is one of the di most difficult things about having a practice is managing a team because people are challenging in it themselves. And of course, staying relevant is something that's important. So whether that's, you know, going on social media and letting the, your prospective patients know what you're about, or it's learning the new latest and greatest techniques and technology, you have to stay up on it, which is cool. I enjoy that. All right. So we're going to go into our second uh, part of the program, which is a case study. And it looks like I'm right on time. And this is a case I recently finished. I'm really happy how it turned out. And I thought it was interesting enough uh, because it was a multi-specialty case, uh, meaning I worked with a periodontist also. And uh, we had a really nice result and it involves a few different things. So let's get right to it. 33-year-old female. She comes in to see me, a new patient exam. And... You look at her front teeth and yeah, they're, they're not the most aesthetic in the world, but they look fairly healthy. Only when we take x-rays, we see a little bit different story here. So we see that she has four crowns across the front and she also has uh, four root canals. So I ask you what in the world happened to this woman who had four root canals at 33. And also I noticed some interesting shadowing in her x-ray on one tooth. So turns out, she had a bike accident when she was much younger and landed on her face. And, you know, while this aesthetic dentistry isn't the greatest in the world, you know, you have to think this happened years ago and it's worked for her thus far. Um, so here we are with four root canals, meaning that she had some pretty sub substantial trauma to those front teeth where the nerves uh, were either exposed during the fall when the tooth, when the teeth broke, or perhaps they became infected after. And what I'm seeing here in this red circle is called resorption. And we don't always know why resorption happens, but resorption is a situation where you have cells of the tooth that are eating away at itself. I always tell patients it's like an autoimmune condition where maybe you lose your hair because your hair follicles are being attacked by your immune system, something like that. It's not exactly the case, but that's my best analogy. So in this situation, three of those teeth that had crowns and root canals are fine, but one of them from that trauma started to resorb. And while the tooth did not seem mobile, 
this was something where I knew that if we didn't act with some type of urgency, then she probably was going to lose that tooth uh, when she was biting down on a, a, a bagel. Um, and all of a sudden we have a much more complicated scenario. So I talk to patients about this type of thing all the time. Do you want to be proactive or do you want to be reactive? Do you want to wait for that tooth to break or would you rather try to get ahead of it? And if I can convince a patient to be proactive, it makes their lives and our lives easier because we actually can plan ahead of time. Instead of having them show up to my office crying because their front tooth broke off, we can get ahead of it and say, okay, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to put you in a temporary bridge. We're going to do this. We're going to do that, blah, blah, blah. And that's why being proactive is really helpful. So one of my suggestions to you at any point in time is when you're communicating with patients about their issues, ask them if they want to be proactive or reactive. All right. That's really helpful. All right. So here's some tooth numbers, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. So six through eleven, that's canine to canine. We can see that there's crowns on eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Nine is the tooth that has the resorption. And so what do we do about the situation? She's not happy about the aesthetics of her smile. You know, the, the teeth are a little bit opaque. There's not a lot of life to them. Um, because the one canine and one lateral inc incisor weren't covered, you can really tell right away that she's had some dental work because there's clearly two natural teeth in the front and four <laughs> teeth that have been covered by ceramics. So that's something to be paying attention to. Um, she also has an uneven gingival zenith, which is basically stands for the height of where the tooth comes out of the gums. It's uneven between the two front teeth. And because this patient has a fairly high smile line, it becomes very obvious what's going on here. So one of the things that you can pay attention to when you are treatment planning for an aesthetic case is that area towards the top of the tooth. Maybe the, maybe the lip is covering it and it's not super important, but this patient shows a lot of her, her uh, gums when she's smiling, which can be for a number of different reasons. So this actually matters to make sure the height of these two front teeth matches up. And if we can improve the tooth to gum ratio, that would be appreciated on her behalf. So these are all some aesthetic dilemmas that we have to you know, learn how to treat the symmetry of the natural teeth to the crowned teeth, the gum levels, the ratio of the central incisors to the lateral incisors. How are they in proportion to one another? All these things matter. And of course, the lip height. So when I'm looking at an aesthetic case, it's not something about making pretty preps on the teeth and putting pretty porcelain on there. You have to know the biology, what's going on behind it in order to create the best solution. So I outlined, and usually when I have cases like this, I like to put a little outline on patients' smiles so they can see what I want to accomplish. I want to raise the gum height of the tooth number eight to match where it is on number nine. Um, number nine, obviously, is the tooth that has to come out. And if we can raise the gum line a little bit on the lateral incisors, that would be great too. Okay. So here's the post-operative x-rays. I think maybe maybe before I cemented. And what you can see here is that tooth number nine has the implant, okay? Then tooth number 10 and 11, they have the same root canal teeth. They have new restorations, new crowns in them. Tooth number eight is also a crown, but looks different than the other ones. And I'll explain that in a second. And then we put veneers on teeth numbers six and seven because we want to blend everything together in order to make sure that the smile does not appear overtly touched by dentistry, symmetry is super, super important. And you've heard me say that a few times. So why do the two crowns in the front look different? Well, this tooth right here, can you guys see my mouse, Crystal? Okay, this tooth right here, that's covered with something called a PFZ, which is a porcelain fused to zirconia, which is different than these more uh, translucent crowns, which are lithium disilicate or Emax, perhaps you've heard of that. Now these crowns over here are Emax. So why would I choose Emax veneers, a PFC crown here, and two Emax crowns here? 
Well, the answer is we want to create, again, that symmetry and that balance. So because purely Emacs crowns, which are more translucent, are typically not recommended over abutments, which is the connecting piece between the implant and the crown. So the, the abutment is right here. We want to use a material that will properly block out the color of the abutment, which oftentimes is gold or silver, and then cover it up with a aesthetic porcelain. So what I did for the tooth next door is I used zirconia, which is the same thing I used for the um, to cover the abutment of the implant crown. And then I layered or had the lab layer Emacs porcelain on top of those two. So we're combining the aesthetics of Emacs and the strength of zirconia and the ability to opaque something underneath with zirconia because it's really, really opaque. And that's how we're able to get a nice result. And so if you're not into blood, uh, I guess don't do surgery, but here's, here's the preparations. You can see in the middle, there's the implant. This is after months of healing. I did some soft tissue lasering to improve the gum height. These two teeth over here are veneer preparations. This is the crown, this is the crown, and this is the crown. And I can only work with what I was, what I inherited. So I kind of had to just use the crown preparations and alter them slightly from what was there before. But here's before we uh, restored everything. And uh, like I said, veneer, veneer, crown, implant, crown, crown. And here's our final result. As you can see, Emacs porcelain on the two front teeth really blends in very nicely and you really can't tell the difference from, uh, you really can't tell the difference between veneers, a porcelain fuster zirconia crown, porcelain fuster zirconia implant crown, and two all Emacs crowns. So, knowing your materials and its limitations and its strengths, super, super important because it's not one size fits all. So we went from this to this, and now the patient's obviously very, very happy with the result. The teeth are symmetrical. They have a better uh, tooth to gum ratio. She can smile more confidently. Um, and she and I were both relieved after probably close to a year long process. Um, and uh, she's very, very appreciative. And so am I, because that makes me really happy to give her that result. So that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I really appreciate your time. I know we're gonna do a little Q and A, but um, if you wanna reach out to me, I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, this is my Instagram handle, Dr. Limbarakis. And uh, yeah. Take a look. I try to post some educational stuff too. And I'm always happy to uh, to answer questions if, if you need any help. So thanks again. So for anybody ha uh, who has any questions, if you could send them in the chat so that way we can read them off. Um, first question is, what type of activities did you do to engage, to increase your manual dex uh, dexterity? So I had taken art classes in college and I also had played instruments earlier on um, in my life. So it's not like they're, you're going to put on your application. I play guitar and they're going to ask you to bring the guitar in with you, you know, but be honest, but those are, those are some simple things. I mean, if you play an instrument or like to paint or draw, I mean, those are really immediate, easy things that you can do. Thank you. Um, the next question is, so it's based on the patient that you discussed. Um, it says, what is the black looking mass on both sides of the back of the mouth? Where are we looking here? Um, the black looking, what was the word? A mass on both sides of the back of the mouth. I'm not sure which picture, the last picture. This one? The, okay, can you tell, share the question again? Okay, it's what is the black looking mass on both sides of the back of the mouth? Black looking mass 
Uh, they said the picture before that. This Is one, maybe? Yeah, it's that one. Um, Where are we looking here exactly? If you can unmute yourself and ask the question, too. Yeah, it was just the picture with the front tooth without the veneers. Oh, okay. But it's the back. Oh, here? Yeah, like the back of the, the, te the teeth in the back. Is that like a filling or is that like in those teeth in the back? Oh, the like right here? Like yeah. yeah. Okay, that's probably a silver filling there. There. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good eyes, though. You, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you caught me off guard. I was like, did I miss a black mass on something? <laughs> yeah, those look like silver. That's a silver fin there. That could be a little stain there, maybe perhaps decay. Um, I know the patient's going to have an implant down here. So, yeah, I mean, there's other things going on, but this is these are the most immediate. Like, this is the this is the big aesthetic case. Okay, next question. Um, how often do you send kids to a pediatric dentist as a general dentist? That really depends on the person because for me, it's just really not my thing. Um, but I also like the interaction with, that I have with kids. So it really depends on who you're like, who's the, the person in the chair. And a lot of times, you know, kids are just nervous because they don't know what's about to happen. And many times parents have their own dental phobias and dental anxieties that they um, subconsciously or consciously like project on their children who become scared. And so if a child does great in the hygiene chair and they say, let's just say they need a filling, I'd be happy to see them. But if there's someone who is having trouble even during a hygiene appointment, I know that I'm gonna refer them to a pediatric dentist. And ultimately, my goal is to make sure that the patient has the best possible experience. So whether that's referring to a pediatric dentist or referring to an oral surgeon for their wisdom teeth or referring them to, for an implant, the goal is to make sure that they have the best possible outcome. And if I know that I can't provide that for them, or maybe I don't have the patience for a child that needs to hear about Mr. Thirsty and here's your raincoat and this is your tooth pillow. And if I don't have the patience to do that, then it's better for a pediatric dentist to do that. So for me personally, I refer out fairly, like fairly often um, if they need dental treatment, if it's cleanings and my hygienists are happy to treat them, I'm happy to do an exam. That's no problem for me. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what was the most exciting and most challenging part of dental school for you? Um, the most challenging, I would say, is from the like the science and didactic perspective. As I mentioned, I was a history major. And so while I do like science now, um, I really was more passionate about history previously and I'm, well, I really still love history. And so going from having a predominantly history-based education to having microbiology and pathology and um, all those like advanced, advanced sciences was really, really tricky and really hard. But end of the day, dental school is not easy for anyone, whether you're a bio major or not, because there's going to be something that you're going to have to work through. Um, at least it was for me. And so that would definitely be, it was the hardest part is just learning that it's going to be hard and you have to just, if you want to do it, you got to get through it. And that was, yeah, rude awakening. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the most challenging. The most rewarding, um, yeah, there's two, I would say there's maybe three, I have three answers for that. One is just the satisfaction of doing something that's incredibly difficult. Getting through dental school is getting into dental school and then getting through dental school is, is not easy. So 
you know, the self, the accomplishment for myself to do that was incredibly rewarding. Um, I also enjoyed, you know, doing learning dentistry and communicating with patients, the feeling of knowing that, okay, I'm going to slug through these uh, science classes because I know when I'm with patients, I'm going to be at my, be at my very best. So when I got there to know, okay, yeah, this is validating. This is what I was supposed to be doing all along. That was very, very rewarding. I also enjoyed um, the cadaver lab because I felt like that was my first time really feeling like I'm earning my role as a doctor. And uh, don't let anyone tell you dentists aren't doctors. That's first of all, the stupidest joke I've ever heard. And uh, you really earn it. So um, if someone ever says that to you, ask them if they've ever um, opened up someone's body before and uh, had to dissect a body. Okay, then answers probably no. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what did you specifically look for in a dental school when you were applying? Well, um, tuition was important to me and proximity. Um, I did apply to a number of schools. I want to say I applied to like 11 or 14 schools. So what mattered to me is a good clinical experience because I knew I want to become a general dentist. I didn't necessarily have an interest at that point in time for to, to, you know, to become a specialist. So clinical experience in general dentistry and tuition. And so since I went to Temple and I'm from Pennsylvania, that was a perfect match for me because they're public, they're state funded school. Thank you. Um, next question is, is there something you would change throughout your dental journey? What would it be? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, I don't know that I would change anything because I've gotten to the point where the challenges and the difficult experiences I've had have brought me to a place where I've grown because of them. Um, I did two associateships. Um, so my path was after dental school, I did the residency, which I think is an absolute must, you know, especially in today's day and age, because you just need the repetition um, before going into practice. So learning and growing in a residency program was super important. Then I went to an associateship after that. And it was a great experience in Ronald Guard and uh, in other experiences, I learned what I didn't want to, how I didn't want to run a practice. So even though I had those challenges and the maybe would have preferred a softer landing. Um, I still, I still don't regret it because I learned how to, how to do something the right way and how other ways to do it. If that makes sense. Um, next question is my dad is a dentist too. Is it important to mention that in personal statement interviews or mainly talk about your own personal experiences? Well, I don't know what an admissions counselor would say about that. So I don't want to mis mislead you here. Um, but I do think it's important. And you think it's just a general thing to, it's an important thing in general, um, because you can mention, I, I've seen the ability that my dad has to transform lives. And I, know that the uh, impact of a dentist a dentist has is, is what I want to do with my career because I've witnessed that in my father and I'm eager to do that. You know, you could, you have to make sure you spin it the right way. If, um, if you just say, I want to become a dentist because my, my dad's dentist and, you know, we go on vacations every summer. Well, I mean, that's not a good way of saying it. So just be smart about how you use it. You're, you're your own person and, you know, you have to make sure you come off as someone who's independent, but, you don't have to look past the fact that you come from a dental household. You know, I would say like 40% of my class had dentists in their family. So it's not something unusual. It's something that they haven't heard before. I don't think it gives you a leg up um, unless they're an alum of that school, but I don't think you need to shy away from it. Just make sure that you are presenting yourself as your own person. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any other questions, if you could just put it in the chat, I'll give a 
one more minute and see if there's any more questions. Yeah, these are great questions and a little bit all over the place, which I like. Just gonna wait a little bit, see if anybody has any last minute questions. Sure. I have a question. So, um, so you know how you said you were like part of acapella and <laughs> um, for, for things like, um, like if you were playing an instrument or things like that, how would you showcase that in your interview? Like how to, instead of like something that was like put on your resume where they know your activities or they know like something that's already there, like how do you showcase something that was not on your resume? Well, I'll say this, if you want something to be showcased, you need to, you need to mention it. If it's important to you, it should be on your resume. Um, and if there's a way that you can work it in, I guess, let's just say it comes up in a, during the conversation, what do you do outside of school? Like, what do you do? What are your hobbies? You know, mention it. Um, but yeah, there's don't hide. And the plot, your application process is not your time to be shy you need to show who you are and you know make sure you represent yourself well um because they have no obligation to ask you extra questions it's your job to make sure that you present as well as you possibly can thank you um oh, we have one more question which year of dental school was the hardest for you I, don't know, I would, I don't know, maybe it's, it's first or second year for sure. Um, I really enjoyed being in the pre-clinic, which is a lot of fun. Learned a lot of new skills there, but, oh man, balancing all, all of that stuff with just the insane amount of work is just crazy. Um, I don't know what the curriculum is like now, but I had no life, so I had no life every year except for my senior year of, of dental school, which was all clinical, which was super fun, actually. So I would say the first couple of years when it's heavily science based was was definitely the most challenging. Uh, one more round for last questions. Anybody, if anyone has any last minute questions, you can put it in the chat or we can wrap up the session. I think that was it for questions. I don't think anyone else has any more. But again, I want to thank um, Dr. Limberakis for um, holding our session today. It was very informative and you gave us a lot of advice, what to look out for um, when starting our dental journey. Um, that list on the PowerPoint is his Instagram handle. So if anybody has any questions, um, concerns, you can reach out to him. Um, again, I want to thank everyone who was able to come for our live session today. This will be posted on YouTube um, and on our platform, so please check it out um, and be on the lookout for our next virtual shadowing session, which will be next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thanks, in. everyone. Yeah, no problem.